Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us, taking time out of your schedule here to uh, join us for the, the second press conference of the 44th annual meeting. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you to our audience who are watching us over our web channel as well. The, um, the theme of this press conference is actually very important. It's very uh, consistent with a lot of the dialogue and a lot of the talk and hopefully outcomes that, that will be uh, that will be had from this annual meeting. It's about European research. This is the uh, a press conference organised by the European Research Council under the uh, the banner Research for Growth. I will uh, keep my own comments to a minimum to allow my esteemed colleagues here to do the talking. I will just first introduce them. So to my immediate left, I have Helga Novotny, who is the, was the president of the European Research Council from 2010 to 2013, still very much in, involved in the organization. Um, I'm very honored to be joined by Mr. Elio Di Rupo, the Prime Minister of Belgium. And on the far left, Sir Tim Hunt, Professor of Cancer Research UK, based in the United Kingdom, and again involved in the, uh, the ERC and, uh, and is continued striving for excellence in innovation. I'd first like uh, to invite Prime Minister Di Rupo to say a few words and, and talk about the efforts that Belgium is making in the field of European innovation to raise competitiveness, create jobs, and fulfill the, uh, the positive outcomes we hope to achieve um, going forwards. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> first of all, I would like to thank the European Research Council for inviting me here to this press conference. And it's also a great pleasure to have a Nobel Prize winner with us today. Being a PhD in chemistry myself, I'm truly honored to have the opportunity to speak to you uh, today. Ladies and gentlemen, it's clear that fundamental research is of the highest importance. It's the only way to guarantee that Europe's research will be competitive and of great quality. The European Research Council plays a major role in that respect. The Council and other research infrastructures also offer unique research services to people from various countries permitting the application of theory. Let's take the example of François Angler, the Belgian physicist who was awarded the 2013 Nobel Prize together with Peter Higgs. The bold intuition of Angler 50 years ago, postulating the existence of the scalar boson responsible for the mass of elementary particles is one thing, the most important thing, but he had to be associated with the CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research, where the experimental confirmation of the theoretical prediction was obtained. Without this research infrastructure, co-founded by Belgium, no discovery of the famous boson, and probably no Nobel Prize for my fellow countryman, Francois Angler. Ladies and gentlemen, innovation is a key priority in Belgium. We are financing research through federal and regional agency and through a countrywide network of universities. In this regard, I agree with the idea as advocate, advocated in the European research area objectives of a greater alignment between European and national research programs. More than 80% of the research budgets are managed by national authorities and their parliaments. More cooperation between these national authorities, avoid duplication and create critical mass. Ladies and gentlemen, reshaping the world also means fighting poverty and protecting our planet. R&D is a determinant factor in the creation of growth, but we will only achieve durable 
growth and durable prosperity. If we use scientific research and innovation to reduce inequalities. Belgium researchers and Belgium based companies, for instance, have been developing solutions to improve access to basic needs such as drinkable water, food, and medical care. Ladies and gentlemen, as the future of the world depends largely of scientific developments, investment in research, education and innovation need to be safeguarded. I know this is a costly business and some European member states have reduced their research funding under the pretext of austerity. Clearly, it's a mistake. The example of Sir Hunt of Francois Anglais is clear. We must invest in fundamental research with result being appreciated in the long term. We cannot straitjacket research by only requiring short-term objectives for industrial processes. In each case, Belgium continues to commit itself to research excellence despite fiscal consolidation measures of around 22 billion euros. In 2012, total Belgium expenditures on R&D amounted to 8.4 billion euros thanks to the investments of private companies, higher <coughs> education institutions, public authorities, and private non-profit organizations. This amounts to 2.24% of our GDP, a re historical record, ranking us eighth out of the 28 European member states. Thanks to these efforts, Belgium research institutions and companies are, for example, at the forefront in the development of vaccines, stem cell research, or cancer treatments. And the Belgium government has also increased budgets for inter-university cooperation and open it up to institutions of other EU countries. At the same time, we have expanded our contribution to the European Space Agency, bringing it to more than 200 million euro a year. That makes us the fifth net donor to the agency. And we have also taken favorable tax measures for research. For instance, a company hiring a researcher with a monthly net salary of around 3,000 euros can save 20,000 euros a year. And the kind of support has more than doubled between 2008 and 2012, passing from almost 300 million euro to more than 600 million euro a year. That and uh, all the Belgian measures make that within Europe, according to the OECD, <coughs> only in Austria and France, public support for private research is higher than in Belgium. Ladies and gentlemen, let's be clear, R&D cost cutting must not and cannot be uh, the answer. On the contrary, our engine needs more fuel and we want to stimulate our economic growth and to reduce inequalities. Investing in R&D is a leverage for sustainable solutions in and beyond times of budgetary restraint. 
Ladies and gentlemen, to conclude, I wish to salute scientists all over the world. They are at the source of our knowledge and thus of our ability to improve reality. Thank you very much, Madam. Uh, thank you very much, Prime Minister. Now, I'd, I'd, I'd like to uh, have some European perspective. A very, we've had some very good examples of a successful um, country within Europe maintaining uh, its drive for, for innovation. Uh, and I must have Novotny please give us uh, the perspective of the ERC in driving frontier investment. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to convey the greetings um, of my successor, Professor Jean-Pierre Bourguignon, who has taken office on the 1st of January. Unfortunately, he has a fractured arm and could not come. <laughs> so this is why I'm sitting here, but it's a great honor to be here. And I very <clears throat> I'm, I'm very happy that I can compliment what the Prime Minister said about the importance of investing in times of austerity, especially into frontier research, as we call it. The European Research Council was set up in 2007, and it is the first time at, uh, in 2007 that there was pan-European competition for any researcher coming from Europe or even from outside of Europe under the condition that they would be willing to work in Europe. And in <coughs> these past seven years, we have funded more than 4,500 top researchers, two-thirds of whom are starting grantees or consolidated uh, grantees, as we call them, th belonging to the younger generation, and one-third are advanced uh, established scientists. So this means <coughs> that we have recognized the importance that Europe, as Europe is part in this global competition that we are facing, and we can see the rise of publications, scientific publications in Southeast Asia and other places, that Europe as <coughs> a continent um, continues to invest in frontier research. Now, uh, with the new uh, framework program called Horizon 2020, which also starts on the 1st of January uh, this year, the ESC has been recognized as a success story. Uh, and <coughs> the form that this recognition has taken is that we have seen a considerable substantial increase of our budget, going from 7 billion euros now to 13 billions for the next seven years. And <clears throat> the topic that we are really, all of us here are interested in is what is the connection between frontier research where you do not know the outcome of your work. Frontier research means you're pushing the boundaries of what you know into the unknown and you cannot say what you will find. And yet, this is what the history of science has taught us over the last 450 years. There are just some very fantastic technological, medical, and therapeutic, and other things that come out of investing in frontier research. And the connection to what I would like to call radical innovation, the change of a paradigm as it has come about uh, with the rise of the computers, the kind of data-driven research that uh, we now are all habituated to, all this uh, goes back to the work of theoretical and experimental work that was done 50 years, 60 years ago. And therefore, <coughs> I think it is a necessity, an imperative, in fact, if we want to reshape the world, that in times of austerity, um, this must continue, and at European level, it will uh, continue. We have also, from the ERC, set up a very small scheme. It's called the proof of concept for those uh, researchers who are um, <coughs> awarded a very prestigious ERC grant, and we have gained uh, an enormous recognition as the gold standard in Europe in terms of top research. Um, and uh, these grantees, if they have an idea themselves or in their team 
that they think that this can be brought to market. They can apply for a proof of concept. They get a relatively small additional sum of money that allows them to look into patents, allows them to set up a business plan for startups, etc. So this is a very concrete contribution we make to the field of innovation. But above all, we are raising the awareness of these 4,500 people who are really passionate about their research. And they cannot say what will come out of it, but they are aware if there is a good idea, uh, <coughs> we can uh, take this idea one step further to uh, market. So I would just like to conclude in uh, summing up why is the ERC here at Davos? These 4,500 uh, researchers that are all over Europe, although we see a concentration in some parts of Europe, as you would expect, and Belgium, by the way, does very well in terms of ERC grantees, given the size, it has uh, 140 ERC grantees, and uh, some excellent universities and research organizations where they are working. Um, I would like to emphasize that it is important for the ESC to have this visibility. And you, as <coughs> the ones who come from the media, you can help us to continue with this visibility. And the message is, even if policymakers, not all are as wise and far-sighted as uh, the prime minister here, who think we now have to go for the short term and the you know impact driven short term impact driven research um, that it is important that we keep the long term perspective that science offers thank you thank you very much before we go for questions i 'd just like to invite um, Sir Tim Hunt, Professor of Cancer Research UK, to talk a little bit about the uh, theme of excellence only and how you ensure ongoing excellence in European innovation. Yes, <coughs> thank you very much. So uh, we really have two mottos in the ERC. Keep it simple and keep it excellent. Those are our guiding principles and they're the only ones. Just like running a restaurant and keeping it at the peak of perfection day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, it's easier said than done. Maintaining high standards isn't easy. How do we do it? Well, the answer is really very simple. We identify the top experts in a variety of fields, and uh, one thing I'd like to stress is that the ERC doesn't only support scientific research. We also support research in the social sciences, including uh, politics and economics, art history, <laughs> literature. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a broad church. But the key to identifying these excellent 4,500 grantees is to have panels and people who screen uh, the grant proposals that come in. And the success rate of these grant proposals that come in is not high. It's somewhere, what, 12%, something of that sort. Uh, so your chances are only about one in 10 of getting a grant. That means, hopefully, if our panels are doing their job, these are really the top people in their field. And as long as that continues, I think we can be sure that uh, European money will be well mm. spent supporting uh, basic research into all kinds of fields. And it's a very strange thing, but this is something really relatively new for Europe, because in the olden days, I was shocked to discover uh, the, the idea of the European research was to support industry in various forms. And actually, remarkably, uh, the most important thing was really sort of mobility of the people, contracts for doing research. I maintain you can't contract to do research because, as Helga stressed, you don't know what you're going to find. So how can you make a contract to find something when you don't know what it is that's there? It, it, it was absolutely crazy. And actually, they didn't even bother to measure the outcomes of, of, of the research. The ERC has changed all that. And I think it's one of the best research councils and even better than uh, the ones we have in my own country, where there is a terrible tendency these days to put a strong emphasis on uh, what people call translational research. In other words, research which is dedicated to 
particular topics. I, it, this implies that we already know everything that there is to be known, and we don't. I mean, there are just hundreds of things. I mean, one only has to think of the brain, for example. I mean, we don't have a clue how the brain works. You know, it has nerves in it, but that's about it. How those nerves are connected together. Some about 25 years ago, Sidney Brenner in Cambridge worked out how the nervous system of the nematode worm was wired up. But they still don't know how the worm wriggles. Amazing, you know? So even such a simple thing, I forget how many neurons it has. It only has about 100 neurons. And you would think it would be easy to figure out how the worm thinks and works. But it isn't. Now, there are people who want to sort of work out the connectivity of all the human uh, neurons. I say if you can't work it out for a worm, it's unlikely you're going to succeed with humans. But maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> Anyway, the ERC is a fantastic advance, and uh, this idea that we judge each other in a pan-European, not only European, by the way, we have several Americans and other uh, people from outside Europe on our granting panels, really ensures this high degree of uh, excellence, and long may it continue, because it's absolutely crucial. There's so much to find out. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Tim. Possible insight into future research of the ERC into neuron behavior in worms. I, um, before, before we go for questions, could you please give me a, 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 an indication who would like to ask a question? Raise your hand, please. OK. Is that a question? Was that a hand at the back? Yes, madam. Microphone here, please. Could you give us your name, please, and also your, uh, your organization? Thank you. Um, Ting Yen from China Business News. Um, I'm, wo I'm wondering um, which are the areas you think China and Europe can deepen um, cooperations to build innovative economy? And also, um, does ESC have any cooperation with Chinese government or Chinese institutions? Thank you very much. So Chinese uh, mm -hmm. European cooperation past and uh, present and future. Well, uh, from the ESC perspective, um, I want to emphasize the ESC is part of the Horizon 2020 program and the framework. There are parts of the um, program where you have cooperation outside Europe, uh, et cetera. The ESC is focusing on individuals, individual principal investigators. So from this point of view, uh, we welcome also Chinese if they want to work in Europe. And we were in Dalian uh, last year, and we were also in, um, in, in, in China before. Um, but uh, there is a new development that may be of interest also to China. We now have signed two agreements, one with the National Science Foundation of the United States and one with the government of Korea uh, to make it possible <coughs> to have um, <coughs> persons selected on the US side or on the Korean side to work with our grantees in Europe. And this is a way of uh, cooperating, if you want, but the topics, and this is a peculiarity of the ESC, as, as you heard from, uh, from Sir Tim and, and, and myself, uh, in frontier research, you do not know what you will find. So the ESC has no thematic priorities because we think the researchers know best where the next hot topics are. Then later comes the phase when you have to, um, you know, you have goals, you have a mission-driven kind of research, then comes uh, the step where you actually build prototypes, etc. But we are th at the very upfront of knowledge generation. And there we say we leave it up to the individual researcher. We try to find and fund the very best. So I would invite China to come to us and also we could have such an agreement also in the area of frontier research. Prime Minister, would you like to have any, any comments on that? Okay, uh, next question, please. Okay, gentleman at the front. Um, Frederick. Hello. Yeah. Frederick Rohat, I'm the at uh, LECO in Belgium. I would like to, uh, you, you Miss uh, Noot Me uh, talked about uh, global competition uh, for Belgium big question is still the brain drain. I would like to, to know if you have fresh figure uh, on the brain drain in a, a scientific field in Belgium. And if you, if you think that there 
need to be, if, if there are other measures that need to be done uh, uh, to, to prevent this uh, phenomenon. Sir, please. Okay. I think it's a, it's not a, a correct vision of our uh, researchers. We have, as you have uh, said a few minutes ago, uh, many top-level researchers. Um, in many fields, and uh, we are well known to have such a great top researchers, and I agree with uh, what is uh, it's said here uh, around the table. Um, and we have uh, taken a lot of measures, for instance, the tax uh, incentive to keep the researchers uh, in Belgium cost a lot of money uh, for the government, uh, uh, 600 million per euros per year for a, a middle-sized country as Belgium. It's a lot of money. Uh, and the reason is to the, the will to keep the, the researchers in our uh, uh, country. But be sure that we have uh, the for uh, vaccines, for uh, uh, cancer, uh, other uh, medical uh, field, uh, also material sciences, uh, uh, particles, uh, a lot, a lot of very top uh, researchers, and also in the economy of uh, uh, other uh, fields. So uh, I'm not convinced that uh, there is uh, a flow from Belgium to the uh, other countries. But we have to do more, if it's possible, with European Union to keep in Europe and to, to welcome in Europe more and more uh, top uh, researchers. I was very happy to see you where uh, Helga and I visited the University of Louvain, and I yeah. was shocked and surprised to find I two did. of my colleagues working there. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's not all one, it's not all, of <laughs> it's not all go away. We, we, from the ESC point of view, we speak about brain circulation. And especially young scientists are well advised you know, to go and see how the scientific world looks in another place. Of course, we don't want to lose all of them forever. No. So it is important to be attractive for those who wish to come back. And uh, I think especially for Europe, uh, this is very important. And there are some countries that clearly have an enormous loss of young, talented people, especially in Southern Europe these days. And this um, is, again, one of the reasons why I think it is so important in times of austerity not to cut the branches of young, talented people. Uh, and otherwise, in these countries, you have a lost generation. And it takes many years of training. It takes many years of hard work. And even if science is a passion, you still need to work hard at times also. And all this then is lost if these young people uh, see no chance anymore. So I think for Europe as a whole, we have to recognize that in parts of Europe, this is becoming a real, real problem. And this is um, possibly a lost generation of young, talented researchers. Yeah, I mean, I could <coughs> single out the example of Spain where um, they were 20, 30 years ago, fairly scientific, at least in my, my field, bio biology, uh, a rather scientifically backward country. And then uh, the government started investing, and in both in Madrid and Barcelona particularly, I mean, really fine laboratories sprang up, and young Spaniards who'd been trained elsewhere in Europe and America came, came to Spain. But now the government has been so mean, and uh, it, it's just sort of uncertain. That's the... The, the, the problem. I mean, the minute you get people not sure whether they're going to be have a, a long-term future in in basic research, they very they vote with their feet because they're unbelievably talented people. The 
issues. I mean, you know, they're really, uh, they're the tops and they, they, they vote with their feet. Thank you very much, Lost Generation. And uh, of course, a recurring theme of this year's annual meeting is, is what we do to avoid a lost generation and, and, and avoid intergenerational crisis, which Professor Klaus Schwab identified as the number one challenge we face today in uh, our press conference last week. So I thank my panel very much for contributing to the discussion and outlying the role, the very important role that innovation across the world has to play in uh, helping us avoid this. And thank you all for joining us as well. I wish you a very successful meeting. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. You can you can use this room, sir. Can, can yeah, I absolutely. Stay you can stay. Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely.